What's up, guys? This is Net Talk Podcast, episode 001. I'm your host, Matt Parker, and today we're sitting down with, well, I'm on a video call with my dad, Daddy O, my pops, Gary Parker. He's been a lifelong fisherman, fish, fish the cook inlet for a number of years, done Bristol Bay, the same, the gill netting in Bristol Bay. Uh, we sit down, discuss the uh, Bristol Bay forecast for this next season, uh, which I'm going to be leaving to sometime early June. And uh, we discuss the history of the Cook Inlet and the specifically the east side set net fishery and uh, just some historical stuff back there and kind of a cautionary tale for Bristol Bay. Yeah, that's right. So uh, sit back, enjoy the episode. This is a really period two or one period three and the first first number is the age in river or in lake and then the second okay. number is ocean age <clears throat> oh okay um, so total run for bristol bay Good is one. 39 million fish how excited mm -hmm. would you have been if uh cook inlet had a projection like that <laughs> That's a lot. yeah um, yeah that yeah there's no there's no way that cook inlet could handle that many fish you know, it's a uh, it's river systems. It uh, lake systems are nowhere close to what Bristol Bay can do. Yeah, the escapements at twelve point nine million, twelve point eight nine, and the harvest at twenty six point one one million, just a tickle over twenty six. And like I said, they had that as an average year, so twenty eight twenty eight million to forty two million is what they consider average. Hmm. Naknik, which is kind of home base for us is at 15.4 million. The Quijack is expected 6.68 .6 million fish. Naknik, 5.7 million. And then the Alagnac at 3 million. You like my cup? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's dangerous having Jake here as a, as a barista. New Shigak is kind of, it's still got good numbers, but the Wood River is expected at 7.84 million. Nush, 3.5 million, and the Agushik at 1.08 1 million. Igigit kind of smaller too, 5.7 million. Ugashik, 4.78. I think that's pretty good for Ugashik, or it's bad for Igigit. I don't know. I'll have to look at historic numbers. And then Togiak, poor Togiak, 700,000 fish. Not much. Yeah, yeah, that's so. Like weird. you said, there's nothing that really stands out to you as as being anything crazy. No, no, that I mean, you know, I I, I really don't know Bristol Bay uh, that well, but I do know the 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 tendencies or the history of uh, the Department of Fishing Game to forecast and their um, measuring tactics and so on and so forth are are pretty darn good. You know, over the history of since um, our biologists have been doing this, they have a pretty good track record. You know, they they hit and they miss, but overall, you know, they're they're fairly yeah. consistent. You know, they they tend to underestimate a little bit. Um, that's what I have noticed uh, in Bristol Bay, anyway. Um, it's it's always kind of a uh, uh, by guess and by golly a little bit as to where the fishermen are going to go as far as districts go. But that's kind of a in fishery race, you know, for most fishermen. You know, they pay attention yeah. to what's going on yeah, down a, in New Gatwick. Or, yeah, it's a chess game right at the beginning of the year. It's like a stressful four or five days for us because you know, <laughs> dropping your card in the in the first spot is a pretty heavy deal. <laughs> yeah, it is a um, uh, so it, it is a crapshoot. It's a uh, uh, fishermen are you know they're gamblers, so you know that's kind of the nature of the game. Yeah. When I was looking at the the ages, they had them varied by age as to how many of, of one twos were coming back and one threes were expected to come back. Heavily favored, I think all across the board, the one twos and the one threes. Would you expect like smaller fish overall this year, do you think? Like not huge slabs, nothing like Kenai, but 
Do you think that yeah. the overall smaller, yeah. smaller year? Right, right. I, I, I sure would. It, uh, you know, the, the bigger fish are always going to be in those, you know, four and five-year-olds that, that return back. You get one twos and one threes, and you're definitely looking at a, a lower yield, pounded yield uh, per fish. I don't think I have it written down, but they had an average. I watched the the YouTube video on their forecast for this year, and they had an average weight expected, but I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a big factor, you know, um, for a couple of reasons. One is what size of gear you're going to put in the water, and and two, you know, just catching smaller fish means that your poundage is going to go down for the year. You know, those those yeah. are obviously factors. You know, and yeah. uh, things that fishermen have to take into consideration. And one, I'm probably not going to catch as, yeah. as much pounds as I would have hoped to catch. And two, I better be geared up for, you know, the potential of fish getting through my net just because they're smaller. Yeah. yeah. Um, how often did we change our gear size? I was never really, I was kind of mostly in la la land when I was fishing. I just go out and drive the boat and pick fish and come back and eat and sleep. And I was never really privy to any of the, the strategic side of things on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you, you have know, multiple, multiple mesh oh, sizes. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. Multiple mesh sizes, uh, was, uh, very, very important. Uh, earlier in the season, we would catch smaller fish, you know, and, uh, and I would throw smaller gear like, uh, you know, for cooking at five and an eighth or, you know, a five and a quarter would be a little bit smaller than the average fish that you would catch mid mid run. I'd go up to five and three eighths, five and a half, even up to five and five eighths a gear. And wow. then, uh, you know, I you kind of throw it in there sometimes. In and I would always keep uh, nets to the side, ready to throw out there, based upon you know the the size yeah. of fish that was coming through. You know, a fisherman who's worth his salt in anything is going to pay attention to that. You know, I know yeah. Bristol Bay, uh, the the color of the gear that they have, the big thing. They don't want fish going around their nets. I didn't have to worry yeah. about that. I was more concerned about a mesh size uh, than anything. And to answer your question, yes, I did have multiple sizes of, uh, of nets. Sometimes in the heat of the moment when fish are really flying, you don't care. You just get a net that's in decent shape out there. You just, you know, you just get it in the water. Yeah. And when I could, I did. I did uh, pay attention to the gear yeah. side and would, uh, you know, approach it that way for sure. Yeah. Cool. I, I think that's all I really want to cover on, on Bristol Bay. Cause I want to get to this video that you shared with me. I watched it the other day and I was fired up dad. Like I was, I was kind of pissed like to see what has happened to that fishery that I grew up in. Uh, the set netters are done this year. They're not fishing. You yeah. know, what fishing game told them, Sorry about it. You can use some dip nets though, and use that as your commercial harvest. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> that's yeah. That's that's just a, it's a slap in the face. And uh, you know, I I think for on the most part, most of set netters there, especially on the east side, have seen the writing on the wall here for some time. And and obviously, you, you know, you referred to the you know, that documentary that was made in, I believe it was 1988. That was put out through our local fishermen's organization called KPFA. And uh, they had the major hand in doing that. And uh, the writing was on the wall then. The fishermen saw it coming and were doing their darndest. Uh, you know, we were doing our darndest to, to fight it. Seeing what was coming, uh, which is exactly the state of the fishery at this point not even not even having a season it's already been declared and uh so it's it's been coming yeah. it's been coming for a while and anybody who wants uh you know a, a little bit of the of the history uh go look up that documentary that was put together in 1988 it kind of tells the story of what was happening and what's coming and now is it is un it is yeah. very unfortunate very yeah. unfortunate yeah so that video is titled KPFA East Side Set Net Fishery. The owner of that video is Sarah Hudkins on YouTube. And I was scrolling through her, her YouTube channel and found a couple more videos similar to that. I haven't had time to, to look at them, but it should be some really good content. I want to go through that timeline that they lay out in that video. 
they say early 1800s commercial fishing starts on the Kenai. Is that like more of a subsistence commercial fishery, you think? Or were they really gearing up and were they canning fish and selling it? Uh, well, the history of uh, the fisheries uh, in Cook Inlet especially uh, started with fish traps there in the inlet, which was predominantly owned by big business. Uh, matter of fact, completely owned by big business from what I recall. But it was uh, mostly fish traps. Uh, from what I understand, I have talked to some old, old timers back in my time there that actually um, had gear, uh, set net gear that they ran between those big fish traps. Hmm. But it was uh, the commercial fishery back in the day. Pre now, this is pre statehood, so it's pre 1959. Was a fish trap owned by big companies um, harvesting massive, massive amounts of uh, fish in those traps. They were super, super effective and a very easy fishery as compared to you know today's fishery with having to. Uh, harvest your fish through gill nets or pursing or so on and so forth. These fish traps were, they were a phenomenal tool for harvesting fish. They were very, very efficient. But like I said, they, they were, yeah. uh, they were pre statehood and uh, it was uh, very much for uh, just getting fish out of the water and into the canneries. And they were called canneries at the time, because as far as I know, pretty much a hundred percent of the fish went into cans. So you know, you can you can go through the the area there in Cook Inlet and still see, or at least years ago when I was there, you could still see the the canneries and the the great big pressure cookers that you know a man could walk in. It was a, a phenomenal operation that they had at the time. But um, when Alaska became a state, the pressure of the people uh, pretty much eliminated the fish traps. Uh, it just it wasn't going to be compatible with people moving into the area and trying to establish livelihoods and business and so on and so forth. It was pretty much a monopoly. And uh, there was a lot of pressure from the people at the time to do away with those fish traps. And that's, that's what they did. They pretty much shut it down at statehood. Hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's the second little tick in my note is statehood in 59 traps outlawed drift and gill set net allowed. Right. Um, right. Then my next tick is I didn't know this. Sport fishing really started popping off on the Kenai in the 70s. So commercial commercial harvest had already been around for over well over 100 years before the sport fishermen even really got there. Right. And they start pulling these massive kings out of the river and word spread like wildfire. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's that's kind of the story, <laughs> man. That's kind of the, the beginning of uh, the end for commercial fishing there in the inlet is you nailed it. Yeah. And then at the at the most 18 years later bob penny has this wonderful idea kill the commercial set netters have it done by 1991 and then uh give the sport fishermen the first crack at the fish on the river and it's like what about the excess oh the excess we'll put a fish trap in the river 40 miles up that'll do it even the biologists were like you can't no no you can't do that it sounds like they almost did it well, yeah, it was called Project S, and and uh, that documentary kind of lays some of that out. But this particular person, Mr. Penny, had started, uh, began the assault against the, particularly the East Side Set Net uh, commercial fishing endeavor years before then. He was a uh, uh, fairly, a, a pretty affluent man. Um, he had lots of money to throw at his passion, which was to eliminate um, those gill nets that were killing, as he put it, the this priced king salmon. And and uh, you know, there's no doubt that you know the the king salmon, especially you know those those great big slabs, which I've seen many many of, are a amazing fish. They they really are. So it, it wasn't a hard sell on his part with the particular clientele or people that he pandered to, which happened to be, you know, some powerful people, people who could pull strings in government and, and uh, so on and so forth. And, you know, so um, he welded a, a very big stick that the typical commercial fisherman was not only not prepared for, but didn't want to be prepared for it. So, you know, it was the war that 
uh, was uh, declared upon uh, Eastside Set Netters that not one Eastside Set Netter welcomed it, not in any way, shape, or form, but became forced to enter into that world um, that they didn't want to enter into it and did the best that they could, but, you know, we're fighting a fight that, um, you know, <laughs> out strategized, out monetized, you know, um, <laughs> time, effort, passion. I mean, I, the passion was certainly on the, on the, uh, commercial side, but the ability just wasn't there. What you saw in the documentary in 1988 was, you know, our best efforts to try to get some help by hiring some people to put this documentary, documentary together. Um, so the, the men and women of the fishery had that, um, uh, intelligence to know that we needed help to do it. So that was really our first concert, concerted effort towards fighting. It was um, public opinion. And, uh, and that was the intent of that that documentary. It was very well done, and uh, but unfortunately not enough people watched it. And the people who didn't care about it simply did not care about it. You know, they, you know, they would uh, posture that their that um, empathy for our plight, so on and so forth. But hey, the money was in the king salmon. It was the best interest for the state of Alaska. Da da da. And, and uh, so they they postured their arguments and packaged it in a very clever, uh, good good way for their strategy. They knew what they were doing. And um, hmm. so you know, it was like <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, a weak man trying to fight a fight, uh, a strong man. It, it's, yeah. you know, the weak guy's going to lose most of the time unless he can get a, a great shot in, you know. Uh, there's no doubt that the east side set net fishery was the underdog yeah. in this battle. And uh, that's what you see with the Project Us and what uh, uh, Mr. Penny was uh, pushing forward there. Again, the documentary is pretty well done. It's full of great information, but now at this point, it's history, and uh, the greatest fears of the of the commercial fishermen have have uh, befallen them. And uh, you know, it's it is a sad story. Um, can it be recovered? You know, I would say if you ask most people, uh, there's no more hope for that. I think most of the people have moved out of that area and um, or out of that business and re either relocated or got other jobs so it it truly is a very very sad story and uh you know and it's something that others can learn from oh certainly i would hope so and uh because i can kind of see the that coming for bristol bay or other area fisheries um, it's a it's a mentality yeah. and uh yeah if if that helps to answer your question man it was a little long-winded i don't know yeah, no, it's that's great. Um, yeah, so they, they <clears throat> I don't know what year they said that they did it, but uh, there was a year that the set netters allegedly were releasing live kings, and I believe that to an extent. Um, the king, uh, when they did it that year, their their, their king harvest was down 40%. Uh, when they would get a live king in the net, they would release it. Now, a great man once said, all fishermen are liars except for you and me, but sometimes I wonder about you, <laughs> right? Uh, I, don't know. I don't know how true that really is. I'm sure that some people did it, uh, but fast forward to last year, and uh, that rumbling was going on in Bristol Bay. And I even talked to a man uh, when I got off the boat last year on a, on a tender that was also getting off. He said that he, he released a handful of live kings. Uh, so is it the same story as Cook Inlet? No, but that kind of scares me. Like, I know there's not as much sport fishing pressure on Bristol Bay, but that's not, <laughs> I, I, that's spooky. Right. The first time I heard that on that, on that doc documentary you showed me, it was like, that's not good like the writings there's some stuff starting to be written on the walls you know yeah uh yeah and uh to answer your question um 
many many fishermen uh, i know for a fact did release um live kings um the um uh, yeah. the, the the overall um uh, effort towards that i don't believe was was really that great um the even in releasing the problem is uh releasing a live king the chances of his survival um are not that great after you know they've struggled in a net and so on and so forth yeah it um uh, the yeah the F, i'm sorry go ahead yeah they're, they're spent they have to expound so much energy just to get there right right and uh, it, almost get strangled to death yeah <laughs> yeah and I, like, I would say that it, uh if a fisherman were right on it and for, when talking with fishermen in the times this this was a strategy they pretty much needed to see that king hit so they could get right to it and uh and it was an honest effort on yeah. the most part it, it really was the uh, um but you had to be right on top of it in order to release that king's in a in a manner that the king had a chance to live and uh, the the chances of that fish living is probably greater than what they do with what they call catch and release um that was a, a big argument back in the day um the catch and release that happened on the river um had a much higher mortality rate or so was our mindset than what the numbers were saying that catch and release was a, a very, very um, a detrimental uh, uh, allowance <laughs> in that sport fishery. And uh, there was a, a great argument concerning that, um, that you know, a little bit different than like, you know, a trout or, or what have you, that's not in the end of its life cycle, like you said, you know, struggling, you know, with every ounce of every uh, energy that they had been saving up for this one push up a, a long river going upstream the whole way and and trying to get to that spawning area it is a it's it's a death mark you know and they only have so much energy to be able to do it just enough and um, so you know you can imagine what happens when you when you yeah. spend an animal you know a fish like that you know and, and catching them and, and wearing them out um, the, they're fighting for their lives. Don't think for a second that they're not going to expend all of their energy. And and the strategy yeah. of catching a, a big they're, salmon is to not spend in on the gig. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're not in on the gig. Like, no, I'm going to get my picture taken. And exactly. I'm going to get back to my death march. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's a good way to put it. You know, they're not in on the gig. Hey, save a little bit of energy so you can get up the river. You know, it's, it, uh, you know, and oh, well, here's the evidence of it is, um, you know, I, how, I cannot tell you, and I know you know this too, you saw them all the time, how many fish uh, we would actually catch internet that had obviously gone up the river, had hooks in their mouths, and, uh, and they were emaciated. Yeah. Um, they, they were already, I, how they got into our nets, I don't know, because they were just, you know, they were, uh, you know, they, they looked like what they call zombies <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, uh, they had, yeah. they had hook marks. They had, a lot of them had hooks in their mouths. You can go to, to any of the, uh, you know, of the shore fisheries you know, or even the, I don't know about the drift fisheries, but the shore fisheries and in their beach cabins and stuff, most fishermen had, you know their trophy lures that they had taken out of the mouths of fish, and uh, you know I know you've seen it, and I know you took out lures. So you know I know it's a big yeah. thing. Uh, they just don't make it up the river. So I mean that is a problem. It is a problem. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, um. Yeah. That's crazy. I don't like it. Yeah. I like where it's going. So no, what? No, there was some lawsuits. There were some lawsuits going, right? That the commercial fishermen ended up having to do. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, again, it's uh, the it's an uphill. It was an uphill uphill battle. And, 
you know, trying to go into the court systems was, you know, a last resort, you know, it's like, again, there's not one fisherman that wanted to spend his time and energy and resources, you, you know, in a stinking court. You've got to be kidding me. It's uh, uh, the men, minds and mentality of the, of the working class, you know, hardworking men and women was not there. Um, it's especially in the generation where the, uh, the main thrust of the attack took place. You know, these, uh, today generation would call us and, you know, my father's, my grandfather's old timer and, uh, old timers wanted nothing to do with that. And we're basically forced into, um, learning about it, putting a best, their best foot forward as much yeah. as possible. You know, hopefully, hopefully there is a younger generation that might be willing to pick it up and something might be able to be recovered. I don't know. But it'll have to go back and and uh, you know uh, begin to to seek some some help and maybe some uh, some damages concerning what was done. Um, yeah. The uh, because there there was some damages done to the to the fishing fleet, and uh, you know who was responsible. Well, um, that's a that's a good question because. There was a, a push from people like Bog Penny that that kind of were behind the scenes, but their push and their thrust wasn't a, you know, in a uh, a board of fish, uh, which is the you know the um, the entity that's put in place to come up with um, uh, management uh, management decisions uh, and the. And uh, the rules and the regulations involved in managing a resource came to the Alaska Board of Fish. Well, they kind of became the, you know, the bad guys uh, because of their, their gradual compliance to, you know, the opposing uh, industry, which uh, most commercial fishermen saw it as another commercial industry in the sport fishing industry, the guided sport fishing industry. Um, that's yeah. not sport fishing, it's actually a commercial entity. And uh, so it became in, in the commercial fishermen's, the set netter's eyes, a commercial against commercial. So now we're talking about the allocation of a resource. And uh, therein lied the, the great uh, battle was who gets the piece of the pie, so to speak. And, uh, you know, what was in the hands of, you know, our, our forefathers and their forefathers as um a livelihood and a very large piece of the pie began to be divided up as more groups came involved in their desire for a piece of that pie and uh the pie remained the same the pieces got smaller <laughs> to divide it up and uh kind of in a nutshell there there you go <laughs> there you go yeah so you know and that's uh again that's uh you know, we saw that coming years ago and, and, and tried to fight it, but it seemed like the more we fought it, the more groups came involved that wanted more of that pie. And, uh, you know, subsistence fishing was not an issue. You know, that was historically a part of Alaska and was necessary and constitutionally first and foremost. And, and commercial fishing did not disagree. Uh, being that commercial fishermen were also subsistence fishermen. So that wasn't yeah. a problem, but when personal use came in, that's a little bit different story. And uh, now personal use uh, was still for Alaskans, but it brought all of Alaska down into the areas um, that were most accessible, the Kenai Peninsula being first and foremost. So it really inundated the peninsula with personal use fishermen, which kind of grew into the dip net fishery, which became a monster out of control. And uh, again, uh, just uh, pieces of the pie that uh, yeah. came at the expense of the um, commercial fleet there in Cook Inlet. So, you know, and so uh, it's not that it wasn't seen. It didn't. It didn't happen all at once. It was a gradual process of um, dying slowly, so to speak. And, uh, and now, you know, it's. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know about the overall uh, fishery there in Cook Inlet, but from some of the things I've heard, it's. 
it it's not well. It's it's not very good. Mm-mm. Um, to go back to the dip nets, do you remember when that came into play and, oh, and I mean, why yeah. did it come into play? Absolutely, um, Exxon Valdez, uh, nineteen eighty nine, um, was uh, zero tolerance for uh, possible oil contamination there in, in Cook Inlet. And uh, because of that, uh, the oh, rips there and how the water run there. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, Matt. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, because of the way the water enters, uh, kind of in a flushing manner, in in and out of Cook Inlet, um, oil did come into the inlet, but it stayed in the middle of the inlet on the most part. On rare occasions, with uh, various winds, uh, some of the oil did hit the beaches, but it was pretty rare. What happened was the uh, drift fleet, which catch, uh, which catches uh, historically uh, uh, the the lion's share of the fish entering the inlet is uh, does go to the drift fishery. They were out of the water, and the only fishermen stopping what became a monster run in 1989 were these set netters, and uh, we were basically opened. Um, you know, there in early July and didn't shut down the whole month. It was a massive, massive run and a massive effort to um, stop fish, basically stop fish from going up the river. Uh, because an overescapement um, on any river system um, uh, is damaging. Um, there's a, an escapement. Um, yeah. There's an escapement. Uh, uh, what's the right word? Target area for what is a maximum sustained yield, so to speak. I think that's the terms that they use. But anyway, so 1989 cooking was in danger of a huge overescapement. So the set netters were in the water all the time. Well, somebody came up with the bright mm-hmm. idea. Well, let's put dip nets in the river and they can help stop some of those fish from going up the river. They can help kill some of those sockeye salmon. So, you know, uh, ADF and G opened up dip netting on the river and, and, uh, Boy, that was a, that was, what a great opportunity, okay, for local people to put some salmon, you know, in their freezers and, you know, and for their families and so on and so forth. What a great opportunity. And, you know, and I certainly didn't disagree, but I also didn't see what was coming. Um, Those dip netters uh, then formed their own organization. And what was a necessary tool to help stop the fish became a right to do. And uh, and uh, it's a numbers game. Uh, you can go down to the Kenai River, Kasilaf River, uh, any year that, that I was around, anyway, and you would find a massive amount of effort from all over the state, and who knows where else, because there was no way to manage it. There's just too many people, Mm-mm. and the uh, the effort uh, in that dip net, quote unquote, fishery became huge and uh, they became organized they became political and um, and very powerful and so they became a um, um, another very very large um, um, voice for protecting and increasing and improving you know what was a new fishery called the dip net fishery and, and again you know it's uh you know what started off as you know, okay that's kind of cool you know became a monster out of control and yeah. uh and 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 part of the you know part of the um um it's a right thrust <laughs> part of the thrust that is killed that um east side set net fishery especially Part of it, not all of it, um, but you know, again, the the voice uh, for the Dipnet organization is, uh, um, you know, advocating for what what they want, but it's certainly understandable. Uh, became a, a very strong thing. Yeah, uh, and, and again, you-, the, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What's that, Matt? Have, have you ever been down to the mouth of the river and seen that? 
Have you ever been to the mouth of the Kenai and seen that in action, the dip netting? Um, very, very few times. Um, I would force myself to go down there so that I could witness it. Um, I probably did two or three times over the course of 10 or 15 years. Um, it was very, very difficult for me to, to watch because of, you know, um, well, let's just put it this way. The, the side of the fence that I grew up on, the perspective that I had, it was very contrary to me. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the way life is and the way that people are is, you know, you see things from the side of the fence that you grew up on. And, uh, so what was not hard to look on for most people was very difficult for me to look on. But again, you know, I have a, a long history and family history and in that, um, um, economic effort, which was very family orientated, um, uh, small business, um, very personal and very, um, very, very cherished. Uh, so the emotions concerning that are very high uh, for commercial fishing families and their investment in it is much, much, much more than somebody going down with a dip net to go get, you know, 15 or 20 or 30 or whatever fish put it in their freezer. That, it's a, now I'm not saying it's not a cool thing. You know, it, it, it's a cool thing on, on, the, on the front end of it just with a cursory look at it. But if you look at things from the perspective of the families who have had families and families' families um, involved in that fishery, it's a little bit different from where they sit. It is a, it's one of those things that uh, makes your, your stomach ache. Um, it creates ulcers and a, a lot of mental anguish, a lot of mental anguish. Which, you know, you would think as, yeah. as uh, yeah. living yeah. beings that we would have um, empathy to take a moment to look at the other side of the story. But uh, most people, um, I think, would if really presented with it. If you could sit down with a cup of coffee and present it to them, maybe they would. Um, but most people don't really take the time to look at the entire scope of what is happening and what has been happening, which uh, I'll refer to what you said a little bit ago, is is the writing on the wall, is it beginning in Bristol Bay? And I would agree with you, yes, it is. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe this little podcast might help somebody to maybe spur them on a little bit. I don't know. I, I sure hope so. That's what I'm gunning for. Yeah, um, yeah, me too. <clears throat> I've gone down and I've I've, I've seen that I've seen that mouth of the Kenai River during dip netting season one time, and one time only. I was <laughs> I was absolutely disgusted at the amount of humanity. Yeah, I mean I mean they're, they're raping the river, like <laughs> it's that's all the that's the only way I could really describe it. Uh, the the amount yeah. of trash that was there, just the, like. Yeah. And, and yeah, but you're right. I, I you're, totally right. you're right. You're right. You're right. You got to see the other side of, you know, family coming down and we're going to go get our, our 45 fish for all six members of our family and let it all get freezer burnt. I get that. <laughs> um, but uh, no, really, tr truly I do. I, you know, I, I understand that. Uh, it's uh, it's like collecting unemployment. If you're off of work, it's like, it's there. Uh, yeah. Are you yeah. dumb not to not yeah. to do it? Yeah, it's you know. Yeah, like, no, exactly. They're just uh, exactly. They're not. They're not the problem. <laughs> no, no, no. They're they're not the problem. And uh, you know, they're they're families. You know, and they're friends, and they're they're good people, and so on and so forth. Uh, but but there's a bigger picture to life itself in general. Um, it uh, you know it's uh, we have um, responsibilities as stewards over any resource to to manage it and to manage it well. Okay, well that's kind of a a, a big can to open up. <laughs> you know is what is what is um, 
what is good management? What is, uh, uh, what are, you know, it's one thing to regulate something, but is it regulated well? Um, you know, these are all, these are all good questions. And, uh, you know, and, you know, th there has to be a foundation of, of understanding or belief or whatever you, um, how, however you want to put it, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, take into thought or your, or your mind, um, the issue with, uh, um, kind of the history of our country and what happened with the, with the railways and building the railroads and so on and so forth. And, um, Hey, you know, if they needed to go through somebody's land, well, you know, they, um, you know, they basically took it, you know, and, and ran them out because they could, because it was for the benefit of yeah, you, the people, right? Get railroaded. Yeah, they got railroaded. <laughs> yeah, you know, and yeah. and that's kind that's kind of the mentality of 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 what we're kind of, what we're fighting against. And you know, I had a wise man tell me, you know, um, the uh, the idea of what a democracy is and, and he said he, he said gary it's it's mob rule he said that if enough people want it they can take it um hmm. but you know looking at our country we were founded uh, to be a a uh, republic a representative representative republic which means we have representation okay uh, where uh, the difference between a, a constitutional republic and what a, our democracy has become is mob rule in, in essence. And that's what you'll see in a snapshot of what that really is. Look at Cook Inlet. And because if enough people want it, then they can take whatever, even historically, that which has been there and thrived and prospers and, and built families and shopped at local grocery stores and put their children through their local st schools and and uh and picked up you know um part-time jobs full-time jobs raised their kids so on and so forth was all shoved to the side for the case of mob rule enough people want it they can take it and so and so they did and, um, you know, in a snapshot, that's what has happened and continues to happen in many, many places. And honestly, in, in my opinion, it's taken out the richness of, of what our families really do strive to um, create, to inhabit, uh, to become. It's, it's a valued life. And... All the commercial fishermen families that I knew valued the lifestyle that they were living. Well, it's not there anymore. The kids have been scattered. The grandkids are scattered from what was an inheritance, what, which was what families look forward to come together to do. Well, it's gone. It's gone in that area anyway. Maybe some places they, they do it. I don't know. Um, I have some yeah. friends, you know, who do fish in Bristol Bay and the same type of fishery and uh, set netting. And, and of course you, you've been uh, drift fishing there for, for some time now. And, and it's great. It's wonderful. Uh, what an incredible, what an incredible way to make a living. And uh, if anybody hasn't seen it and learned about it or, or may, maybe taken the opportunity to go do it, man, I'd recommend it. But it also might be a, a dying breed too. Yeah. I don't know. It's 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 certainly um, a strong possibility. Yeah, <clears throat> um, a lot of rumblings about about Pebble Mine over the last few years. That's a that's a scary one. Um, I I have a feeling, and I've got a few um, not close close friends, but friends that are fishermen in Bristol Bay, young, young guys. Uh, I, I think there's enough presence and smarts there that they have the, the techniques and the strategies of the, of the old fellers. But I don't think that, at least I hope the, the ego and the uh, going cork for cork with somebody and, and, you know, God forbid, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it, but gunshots on the water. Like, I hope that's going away with the, uh, the old timers. Um, 
<laughs> I, I, I want to think that this next generation coming up fishing is a little bit sharper and, uh, you know, gets involved with the politics of it. Uh, uh, I yeah, a, Mac, I heard a quote Mac, once. It's, uh, if you don't get involved in politics, if you don't get involved in politics, politics will get involved with you. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's an absolute fact. That's an absolute fact, and yeah. I, I I totally agree with you. I hope the younger generation does get involved. Um, you know, I know the older generations that saw this coming encouraged the same thing, and uh, some picked it up, and you know some didn't. Uh, but but you're right. Um, if they want, you know, you know their their livelihood and uh, their you know, family endeavors or whatever they're up to to continue on, they better pay attention to what's going on around them. The uh, yeah, you're you're right. There's uh, boy back in the day, I've seen some things. You know, I've had bullets fly over my head and both <laughs> ramming and and uh, you know that is kind of <laughs> oh, Bristol Bay is kind of like the the pictures that you have of the Wild West. You know, uh, these are guys with uh, yeah. you know strong character strong character yeah. and not necessarily in those situations nice about it matter of fact the opposite yeah. Yeah. and uh but in the end uh those same guys that go sit down down at the red dog saloon saloon and have a beer together and uh you know and once it's off the red dog. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah because that's I that's know. kind of the kind of the gig at red dog <laughs> yeah yep <laughs> i've never stepped foot in that place i've only heard stories um but i will not fisherman's is okay the fisherman's bar there is okay yeah um god man the the red dog sounds like an absolute mosh pit <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know i i spent a whole week there because i was uh on shore with a broken down boat and and uh, I was in and out of there all the time. I didn't see anything that was, you know, over overtly bad. But you know, it's uh, you know, guys get to drinking, and you know, and things happen just about anywhere you go. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it uh, on exactly on the common. most on the most part, on the most part, there is a camaraderie uh, within the the efforts yeah, in exactly. that 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 business. There is a camaraderie, yeah. um, and one of those aspects is a common enemy <laughs> and and i hope yeah. i hope the the fishermen realize that they do have a common en enemy and and it is socialism you know it just you know a lot of people may not know what that word is but pay attention and learn about it and uh that's what's yeah. really coming for their enterprise and uh you know and like project us they want to take it out of the hands of personal effort and hey, let's build a fish trap 40 miles up the river and then we'll divide up the proceeds. Well, what the heck? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you think a, a commercial fisherman is just after, you know, the almighty dollars? He live in a lifestyle that, that he chose to live. Yeah. You know, hey, there is more to it. There is value. In, in what we have done and what any commercial fisherman is um, is endeavoring for and striving for. There's value, personal value in it. And, you you know, if you lose that, you know, hey, just go get a job in the middle of New York. You, know, you can make way more money there. But who the heck wants to do that? You know? You know, not, not, not the people who are out there making a living on the water, you know? Not those people who are who are risking their lives to do what they're doing and loving it. Yeah, we're talking about this is this mm -hmm. does go much larger than what most people realize. It's a, a, a way of life and it's a it's a perspective that should be important to all of humanity. It really should. But unfortunately <laughs> it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah that pro that project us was something else, and uh, you know, Mister Penny has since passed on, and I don't know how or where he's passed the baton to, but I'm sure he did. 
you know, his, his, uh, yeah. uh, legacy is certainly not done. I, I know that, um, uh, that there still is concerted efforts, uh, to keep, uh, keep the, um, the fisheries, you know, the commercial entity side of that squished, keep it down. Yeah. They don't want that to return because they might lose. Uh, it's more than just the King salmon. It's also real estate. It's land values and uh, investments that yeah. different ma people made on the river yeah. or different areas that, that, that they can draw big money people into and purchase prop so and so far. I mean, it goes, it goes far, you know, it does go far. It's a, it's a big money game. And uh, unfortunately, the yeah, the it's it's the local people who lose out. It's the community that loses out. It's the the richness of of heritage and uh, of the uh, the history of the people, you know that that loses out. Yeah, you can read about it, you can hear about it, but you won't be able to go see it and experience it anymore. So, yeah. Yeah, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're right at uh, fifty-one and a half minutes here, Dad. Um, can I can I have you end it with uh, a certain certain story that I've heard you tell a couple times from that 1989 season, and uh, a certain European man that you picked up from Seven Eleven to come work for you? <laughs> oh my gracious! <laughs> Uh, yeah, he was, he was, he was Polish. He can barely speak English, but in 1989, you know, we were looking for anybody who could carry a fish. Um, yeah, at one point I had 50 people working for me on the beach with many of them had never even touched a salmon before, but any fish that could be carried means that, you know, myself or my crew at the time didn't have to, and, you know, we we're in the, in totally occupied by just running the gear and uh you know uh, accomplishing the technical side of fishing you know mostly picking the fish and setting the gear and, and keeping things safe so to speak it's a it's a dangerous endeavor and uh so we had people just just moving fish or, yeah. or cleaning fish or washing fish well <laughs> we picked up this great big man he was probably close to 350 pounds on a great big guy. He could barely speak English. And he was, he was from Poland and, and, uh, okay, come on, you know, we, you, we can put you in the boat and you can at least, you know, help haul fishing over the side, you know, cause that's kind of took a strong man. Well, it turned out, put him in the boat and, and that guy, I mean, he, he would not, he wouldn't lift a fish to save his life. But when it came time for lunch and getting out of the boat, boy, did he move and he could eat and he could eat a lot. Well, anyway, he wasn't long lived, but <laughs> the crew at the time <laughs> thought that they would play a trick on him, play a joke on him. And uh, so <laughs> he had uh, gotten up from the lunch table or whatever it was and wandered out to the porta potty, porta john that we had there, and uh, and disappeared inside. <laughs> the guys, uh, after he disappeared inside, pulled the tractor up right in front of it and locked him in so he couldn't get out. And uh, he's yelling and screaming and pro uh, issuing profanities for some time. And I'm thinking to myself, you, somebody's got to go move that tractor at some point. We're going to need it. <laughs> and this guy's going to come out and he's yeah. going to be pissed. Anyway, he yelled and screamed yeah. and shook that thing for some time. And of course, you know, all the crew, they got a big laugh over it, so on and so forth. Well, it comes to find out, come to find out after the season, somebody's watching the, the TV show America's Most Wanted. And uh, lo and behold, and I saw the little clip. Yeah. There he was. He was a Polish immigrant, da da da. They, they said his name, and it was this guy. And he was wanted for. Uh, some sort of high crime. I think it was murder. <laughs> he was a wanted man on the run, and there he was working, working for me on the fish site. And I, I don't remember his name, but that was the the end of the story. It was uh, he was on America's Most Wanted. And there he was. He had showed up right there on the beach site, and little. I'm gonna have. Uh... <laughs> 
Well, I'm going to have Jake do a little bit of uh, research and start watching America's Most Wanted, and <laughs> he's going to find him. Jake's going to find him. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's so wild. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a pretty oh, cool. uh, pretty interesting story myself. <laughs> Yeah, that was 1989, and uh, a year that will live in infamy. At uh, yeah, Exxon Valdez year, and uh, never seen yeah. so many fish in my life. It was a, it was quite a quite a quite a year. I'd never been pushed or tested uh, like that ever in my life physically. It was 1989. Of course, yeah. you weren't around yet. Nope. 91. <laughs> yeah, you're 1991 model, aren't you? <laughs> yep. 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 Yeah, that's that's the 1989 story. I'm pretty sure you're looking for. Yep, that's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dad. There's a God. There's a lot. There, there's a lot here. I'm gonna I'm gonna get you on again to to for more stories because I know you got them and I know I've heard some of them and been like, how have I not heard this? before ever and you're like well you never asked I'm like well now i'm asking <laughs> we're gonna have uh we're gonna have a good good couple episodes there full of stories so yeah i look forward thanks to again it. dad i i can't tell you how much i appreciate it. yeah well you're you're welcome it's been fun visiting with you man all right thanks dad <laughs>